Presiding Officer, I am pleased to present the Justice Committee's Stage 1 report on this legislation. At the start, the Committee were of the view that this would be a relatively non-controversial matter and that the concerns of witnesses could be dealt with in relatively short order. I regret that this has proven not to be the case. And perhaps for my, the first time in my political career, I've been proved wrong. <laughs> the matter, of course, has as its genesis a, a European Commission review of competition in the liberal law self-regulation systems dating from 2003. Another driver for change was the UK's response to a 2001 report by the OFT challenging restrictions in competition in certain professions, including the legal profession. Following upon an initial review in consultation by, and consultation by the Department for Constitutional Affairs, Sir David Clemente was appointed to conduct an independent review of the regulation framework in England and Wales. On the basis of Sir David's report, the UK, UK Government took forward the Clemente proposals and legislation which became the Legal Services Act of 2007. It is anticipated that sometime in mid-2011, alternative business structures will be commenced in England and Wales. In Scotland, the previous executive established a working group to look at the legal services market in Scotland, which reported in May of 2006, shortly before the last Scottish Parliament elections, which submitted a super complaint under Section 11 of the Enterprise Act 2002 to the Office of Fair Trading, stating that the consumer interest was being harmed by, amongst other things, restrictions on solicitors and advocates providing services jointly and restrictions on third-party entrance to the legal services market. In response to this complaint, the OFT said it was supportive of greater liberalisation of the market and called upon the Scottish Government and the Scottish legal profession to take matters forward and to consider how best these restrictions might be limited. After what might be described in another place as sundry procedure and following upon consultation processes involving both the government and the law society, the government brought forward legislation and the matter came before the committee for stage one consideration. What had been thought to have been a relatively non-controversial measure turned out to provoke a great degree of discussion both within and outside the Parliament. And the committee considered it to be absolutely essential that those whose views were not supportive of the bill have the opportunity to give evidence. The committee considered the bill over nine meetings and received 40 pieces of written evidence. The oral evidence sessions involved the OFT, which the Faculty of Advocates, the Law Society, the Scottish Law Agents, SCOLAG, the WS Society, the Scottish Legal Aid Board, Solicitor Advocates, Professor Alan Patterson, Consumer Focus Scotland, Unite the Trade Union and Gilbert Anderson, Solicitor. The committee also heard from Fergus Ewing, the Minister for Community Safety. May I record the committee's appreciation of all those who were able to provide written and rural evidence, and all of this evidence was carefully considered. May I also thank the committee clerking team, in particular Anne Peat, and also my colleagues in the committee, whose dedication and professionalism is well known to this Parliament. I think that it's fair to say that, left to our own devices, that this matter would not have been a legislative priority. We were, however, mindful of the UK position, and we did accept that a failure to legislate could prejudice a most important sector of the Scottish legal profession. It is important, and the committee report recognises this, to accept that this is permissive legislation and that the vast majority of Scottish law firms will not seek to use it. Use it. The committee also recognises that the principal beneficiaries are going to be commercial lawyers at the higher end of the scale, and whilst it is important that they should be given the appropriate opportunities, we do require to ensure the protection of the core values of the legal profession to protect both the interests of justice and that of consumers. In this respect, the Committee identified a number of issues which the Government should address at Stage 2. In particular, the, the Government was concerned about the regulatory objectives in Part 1 and invited the Government to confirm that their intention is 
for the regulatory provisions to apply to the delivery of all services. The Government responded positively, and that was underlined by Mr Ewing today. The Committee was also concerned about the prospect of bodies external to Scotland becoming approved regulators, and I am, a, I am delighted to note that the Government has again given assurances in this respect. The Committee also reflected on the issue of combining representation and regulatory functions within the one body. I appreciate that this distinction already does exist in organisations such as the Law Society, and it can create what some might term creative tension. How this dual role applies to law society is a matter for the society to resolve, but the committee do not want this kind of difficulty to be exacerbated by additional provisions. The committee also took the view that there was not sufficient evidence to require the establishment of a body in Scotland similar to the Legal Services Board for England and Wales. Again, this is a matter which Mr Ewing has dealt with today. There is no equivalent of the Legal Services Bo Board and thus the role of Scottish ministers becomes extremely important. And the committee expressed concerns about ministerial involvement in relation to the new approved regulators and licensed legal services providers. Independence from the Scottish Government is crucial, and the committee agrees that the Lord President should have a much greater role in the process of approval of regulatory bodies, and that his agreement should be given before any regulator is approved. I am pleased that the Government has stated it will consider bringing forward an amendment at Stage 2 to give the Lord, Lord President a much extended role in this process. In respect of the lack of provision in the Bill requiring the licensed legal service providers to contribute to a guarantee fund, the Committee welcomed the Minister's undertaking to give further consideration to this uh, important point, and we look forward to more explicit uh, explanations and answers being provided at a later stage. Whilst I can understand the concerns in certain aspects of the Bill, the Committee will undertake to look at these matters very carefully at Stage 2, particularly the question of a guarantee fund. The Committee was also concerned about the step in powers in terms of Section 35. It agreed with the Law Society that the Bill should detail when this provision might be used and there should be an obligation on the Ministers to consult on any regulations made in this respect. I am pleased again to note that the Government has given this further consideration and is currently drafting an appropriate amendment, amendment emphasising the last resort nature of this power. I do think, however, that the Committee will be just a little disappointed with the other aspect of the Government's response to this matter, in which they state their opinion that there should not be an obligation of Scottish Ministers to consult on any regulations made under Section 35. The Committee also raised issues about the description of licensed legal service providers, and I know that the Scottish Government are giving further thought to this also. There was a lot of concern expressed about the issue of outside investors, where a broad range of stakeholders expressed anxiety that legal service entities could be subject to prey by organised crime and that the definition of fitness to own was inadequate to deal with this. The Committee recognises these concerns and had sympathy with some of the views expressed. At the end of the day, however, it was of the view that no test can provide a guaranteed protection against undesirable third-party investment. In these circumstances, the fitness for ownership test must be as robust as possible. Again, members of the Law Society have also cons expressed concern about the fitness to own provision, and this has been reflected in the internal debates within the legal profession. The Committee also raised concerns about the issue of legal profession privilege, and again, the obligation of confidentiality and this aspect were referred to in the Stage 1 report. And again, I am pleased to say that the Minister has given an undertaking to review the matter. Sections 64 and 65 relate to complaints about approved regulators, and these provisions provoked some criticism. The Minister undertook to check whether any further provisions were required, and this too is an issue which I can envisage will be debated at Stage 2. Lastly, in respect of Part 2 of the Bill, the Committee had concerns about how sanctions are applicable to outside investors and will operate in practice. 
Part 4 of the Bill deals with the legal profession, and the Committee agreed with the Government that there was no need to impose APS on the Faculty of Advocates, although I suspect that some advocates may want to rebadge as solicitors to take advantage of any APS arrangements. The reverse may also apply.